Hey guys, it's Dr. Drake 63 coming at you again today. Hope you're uh, hope you're doing well, and uh, thanks for joining me. Today, I want to talk about uh, shooting 44 magnums, and in particular, I uh, want to talk about the difference between shooting this recently acquired four-inch model 629, uh, which, if you take a real close look at the uh, at the cylinder, you're going to see that it's still uh, still needs a good cleaning after uh, many rounds at the range today. We're going to talk about uh, shooting this particular firearm and in comparison to this, which is the same thing. It's an end frame. It's got two more inches of barrel, um, and uh, this is the Model 29-2. Now, this has been well documented uh, on my channel here recently within the last month or so uh, as something that I've done some different work on, and uh, we've had, uh, had some fun learning about it. But the, the question I kind of had was, okay... Looking at something that is uh, two inch less barrel, am I going to notice uh, a difference in felt recoil? And, and if so, is that difference in felt recoil going to be something that's an issue? In addition, today I'm going to talk a little bit just about 44 Magnum ballistics, compare it to some other rounds, and uh, just give you a few thoughts. Um, I think the 44 Magnum is an absolutely great round. Up until, uh, up until uh, a few years ago, it was, as, uh, as Harry Callahan claimed, the most powerful handgun round in the world. But uh, it's been uh, surpassed by things like the 454 and certainly the 500 Smith & Wesson. Now, I have had a number of commenters uh, say to me that they wonder why I don't just go ahead and get the Smith & Wesson 500 and kind of get to the top of the pyramid in terms of uh, handgun caliber ballistics. Uh, I have to tell you, just in terms of my philosophy of use, which is self-defense, target practice, and potential uh, uh, for hunting use, that 500 is just simply more caliber and a lot more expense than I need. I do understand why some guys like to shoot that. You know, hey, it's, it's, it's the uh, bragging rights. It's the biggest boom, the biggest bang. I get all that. Um, I personally feel that 44 is probably a little bit more than I need out of a handgun and just about every application with the exception maybe be in hunting. Uh, but in terms of uh, talking about uh, personal defense, civilian defense, uh, target shooting, things like that, the 44 itself, even, even if you're a hand loader, is expensive enough. Uh, it definitely does kick more than some of the other rounds, although for me, I don't, I don't notice it as being too bad depending on the platform you're using, but uh, uh, the 44 is uh, a round that uh, really, I don't believe is practical for say law enforcement use. I think it's overkill for self-defense, things of that nature. But uh, uh, like I said, I, I could see some use for it as a hunting round. And uh, I guess it's my version of going big uh, without going as far as uh, a 454 or a 500. Today we're gonna, uh, Besides talking about ballistics a little bit, we're going to talk about these two firearms and in particular, which one do I shoot better, if either. In addition to that, we're going to talk about um, is there a difference in felt recoil between one or the other. Um, now going into, uh, going into shooting these both today, I would have to say that uh, Number one, um, if you're going to really do a scientific test, every single thing must be the same, the only variable being the barrel length. And we don't have that going for us. We do have two end frames. They're both made by Smith & Wesson. Um, they're both constructed similarly. Um, the, they're both wood grips, uh, stocks, however you want to put it, although this is, this is a, a, a textured grip that has checkering on it, kind of the, the Coke bottle kind of format, target grip. This, uh, which I just talked about recently, this is a uh, palm swell wooden grip made by Hoke. And so not completely apples to apples. And again, if I was going to be scientific, I'd be shooting these off a of bench rest and all sorts of things. So what I will be showing you today is how I shoot from a standing position one-handed, two-handed, single action, and double action. So that's what we're going to look at today. I hope you enjoy. Okay, what you see from left to right are four fairly common handgun calibers, uh, some of which are also used in carbines. 
We're going to start here. This is your 22 long rifle. Next to that, you see the 9 millimeter, 9 by 19 parabellum. Next to that is the 45 ACP. So from a, a standpoint, a diameter of the slug, that is uh, the largest caliber we have represented. This is a 357 Magnum. And this is a 44 Magnum. And these are also shown to you in order of their ability to, uh, to carry power. In other words, least powerful to most powerful. Now, at first glance, if you look at uh, the two on the right, the 357 and the 44, they look like they have a real similar case length. They do. Um, it doesn't really look like that big a difference until you, you look at these from a diameter standpoint, and then you can see the 44 is just so much bigger. And the 44 is just a much harder hitting um, uh, cartridge than the 357. Um, having said that, the 357, in my opinion, is as versatile of a, of a cartridge as you can get out of, uh, whether it's out of a pistol, whether it's out of a carabine, whether you fire it out of a snub nose. Yes, ballistics by the inch all matter. But in terms of its ability to provide defense against two-legged hominids, um, it does more than is needed. In other words, I really don't think in terms of a self-defense or personal defense role, that 44 Magnum is really doing anything for you at that point than the 357. Some may argue that. Uh, the real advantage to the 44 is that it just carries uh, a lot more energy farther. And, um, you know, obviously in a personal defense scenario, that's probably not going to be legal for you. But uh, it's still a, a hard-hitting uh, caliber if you're going to be going through barriers, if you're in an offensive situation, and, of course, if you're going to protect yourself against dangerous wildlife, uh, it is the best option you see there. Apologize in advance for the eye chart, but what you're looking at is a comparison of five different 357 rounds and five different 44 Magnum rounds. On the left is the scale of energy in foot-pounds, and going across the bottom is distance. You'll see that the 44 Magnum simply is a much more powerful round than the 357 Magnum. My daily carry is 9 by 19 uh, the 9 millimeter Parabellum. Um, I carry that in a Glock 19. And as, uh, as has been discussed in other, uh, other videos, uh, I believe for personal defense that uh, that has plenty of capability. Uh, we talked about the 45 ACP over here, and that's represented here by this Colt 45. That's a Series 80. And uh, I kind of um, get a kick when people talk about kick or recoil on, uh, on a 1911. Um, I just don't really see that as being a thing, but that's something more for inexperienced shooters. We talked about 357, and here I've got that represented. I could have picked any number of them, but I picked, uh, I picked uh, the Colt Trooper Mark III, and... Um, uh, this is a this is a representation from a firearm that is no longer made, but was uh, was real big in the 70s and the 80s. This one's from 1976, and then for that 44, yeah, we've seen plenty of this on my channel lately. The Smith and Wesson model 29.2. Um, this is the big boy, the Dirty Harry. A day like today, where I shot about 150 44 Magnum rounds out of a couple heavy platforms, and we're going to get into that comparison in a second. But after doing that and coming back and shooting 100 or so rounds out of uh, out of this guy right here in 9mm, I have to be honest, it, it kind of felt like shooting a cap gun. So it's all relative to what you're used to. But if, if you practice with heavier calibers, guys, you'll get used to them. You'll get used to gripping uh, gripping that uh, that firearm a little bit tighter, and you'll learn. How to shoot those without uh, without flipping your muzzle all over the place but it takes time but back to this discussion about calibers and self-defense and what are your uses and everything else yeah you could uh, you could keep going you could you could keep going to the right you could put the 454 the smith and wesson 500 and you can just start getting into your rifle cartridges too but 
this is uh, kind of the world that most of us live in, and quite frankly, most people are living in this world right here. Most of the most of the shooters that uh, that I see making a lot of noise, comments, and so forth on uh, social media as well as YouTube. This is the world they live in, uh, and 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 believe me, you can get the job done with every single round you see right here with proper shot placement. Any one of these will defend your life. It's just some are going to do it a little bit more thoroughly than others. So we're off to the range and we're taking our first shots with the Smith & Wesson Model 29-6. Uh, first impressions are uh, ready for just a whole ton of recoil and uh, I don't find this to really shoot much differently than the 6-inch barrel 29-2. Um, I think the, the end frame is just heavily enough constructed uh, and it's a well-balanced enough of a firearm that uh, you have the ability to fire it without too much of a big deal if you're already used to shooting with some recoil. Uh, one of the things that I like to do, actually, is tape myself shooting like this and uh, even get into taking some shots in slow motion like you see here and uh, get an idea. What do I do when I fire this firearm? What does is, what is the muzzle do? How much of is, is, is it flipping up and... Where can I maybe uh, do some changes in perfecting my grip so that uh, I can stay on target? Bringing in, uh, bringing in the, the first target, uh, I concentrated on the two on the bottom right. Uh, this firearm had not been sighted in by me, and uh, I figured 12 shots was a pretty good indication uh, of what's going on with those sights. And as you can see, everything's off to the left and uh, consistently off to the left, which means I need to move my rear sight to the right, which I did. That did address the issue we'll see in some later targets. And here we're going to shoot the Model 29-2, and uh, this is also in single action. Everything I've shot has been single action so far, and uh, just enjoy shooting this firearm. I believe it's extremely well balanced, and uh, the end frame, in my opinion, for the 44 Magnum is a match made in heaven. Uh, not so much with the 357s like in the Model 28 or the 27, but uh, I think it's too much gun at that point. But uh, in terms of uh, the 44, it's great. So we're going to look at uh, our first kind of competitive shoot-off. This is single action shooting at 30 feet. This is from the Model 29. Next, we're going to see our results from the 629. And surprisingly, there's a better group happening with the 629. There was one, uh, one flyer, I think, that happened. You can see on the bottom here, that was pre-adjustment. So very happy with those kind of results. Now we're going to be uh, taking double action shots. Here we are starting off with the 29. I probably don't need to tell you because you can just tell one's black and one's stainless. But, but uh, uh, the trigger on this firearm and double action is just simply the slickest revolver trigger I've ever shot. That's including some Colt Pythons and things. It's just really great. Not bad on this uh, Model 629 either. Definitely a stronger pull, though. Um, without a doubt, this is not as slicked up a trigger as the Model 29. So if I was going to use one for, say, a target competition, if I could pick one of those two triggers, it would definitely be uh, the trigger in the Model 29-2. But results are where it counts. Let's call that target back from 30 feet and see what the difference is. Shooting double action with both of these Smith & Wessons. And uh, the first target we're going to look at is coming from the Model 29-2, six shots in double action. And as you can see, um, pulling a little bit to the right, which is kind of common with double action. And here you see with uh, the Model 629, a little bit better group. Uh, there is one, one flyer down there. But uh, I would have to say I'm a little bit surprised, especially with the difference in the trigger. But uh, hey, you know, we're talking about two firearms, uh, both, both kind of similar there. Here you can see I'm starting to rub my, my thumb raw. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Obviously, always, if you're used to watching my videos, I've got to see how quick I can, can empty the cylinder, and uh, that's what we're doing right there. And uh, no, these are not my shots from emptying the cylinder. These are from 
uh, 25 yards. And uh, I'm pointing out on the right, the, the three on the far right are from an earlier effort, but what you see going on in the middle there, those are with the Model 29. And uh, I'm pretty happy with that, be able to, uh, to do that kind of effort at that distance. Now, looking at the same distance now with the Model 629, we were shooting at the center target. Here you can see the wad cutters I was using for that. And, you know, not quite as concentrated around, but uh, I'm hitting center mass of whatever I'm shooting at, that's for sure. And, uh, again, I think uh, the ability to just uh, get some more trigger time on this 629, I can do nothing except get better as well. So definitely, uh, definitely pleased with the results there. And then uh, how, do we, how do we like this in, in one-handed? You know, is it something that becomes harder to control? Uh, pretty much by this time what I'm finding is is the weight of these darn end frames uh, holding it out one-handed, I'm, I'm noticing that it does have a little bit of shakiness going on. I think my arm's getting tired. Uh, one thing I've started doing again recently after years of not doing it is lifting weights. And I have to admit, the main reason I'm doing it is to improve my shooting. But uh, I also feel better. And here you see one-handed uh, shooting with the Model 29-2. And, you know, we're talking... Fully loaded, this is four pounds of uh, firearm to hold out in front of you like that. And to put it in perspective, I've, I've had uh, ARs which weigh eight pounds. <laughs> Shoulder stock and all that kind of thing. So, But uh, just some continued shooting where we're shooting, in this case, we're shooting double action. And uh, the name of the game is practice. Practice, practice, practice. And the only way to uh, get used to shooting with this recoil and things of that nature is by doing a lot of practice. Now, if pressed, I would have told you today that uh, I would expect to shoot the six inch model 29 more accurately than the four inch model 629. And that didn't really turn out to be the case. I did, uh, I did get some better longer distance, I say longer distance being 25 yards. I did get some better um, uh, groupings and uh, more bullseye type hits on uh, on the longer distance with that, but uh, uh, that may also just be a function of being used to the trigger. I also had some problems. the The trigger on that Model Twenty Nine is been worked on at some point. It's super super slick, and uh, in single action, you just can't get your finger near that thing unless you're ready to fire. So I actually had it go off and surprise me a couple times. Uh, before I was honed in on target. Uh, but I will say that uh, I was surprised to find that uh, I shot that 4-inch about as accurately as I shoot the 6-inch. That's one surprise. The other surprise was uh, just the fact that I really didn't notice any detectable difference in, in recoil between those two firearms. Uh, it was a little bit different uh, but it didn't didn't feel as if the four inch, which I would have expected, uh, was less pleasant to shoot than the 29. I could shoot either of those all day. I'd still be shooting them if I could afford to, uh, at the price of uh, 44 Magnum ammo, which is not cheap. One thing I need to attribute that to probably a little bit is just these Hogue stocks. These stocks are very nicely designed, and at least in my hand. Uh, they do a great job of providing me something to, to get a real good purchase on when I'm firing this, this firearm, whether it happened to be in one or two-handed. Um, the only kind of discomfort I had, and you, you probably will have seen uh, from the shooting videos where I put the glove in, is I was starting to rub the inside of my thumb raw. And I don't think that was because of... of either one of these firearms having more or less recoil than the other. I think that's because of the checkered grip here on the, on the Model 29. My thumb goes over the, the top of it right about there, and that's where it was starting to rub me raw like I was going to get a blister or something like that. So I did decide to throw the glove on then. But uh, as far as having any kind of, you know, joints getting rattled, fillings coming loose, any kind of discomfort... Not the case with either of these firearms, and I think part of that's also attributable to the fact that the end frame is just so stout. Now, having said that, 
Um, last year for a while, I owned a seven and a half inch Ruger Super Blackhawk in 44 Magnum. And that thing just killed my hand. Um, I just did not like that firearm, the, the type of grip that it had on it, uh, the, the type of trigger guard it had on it just was a knuckle buster. And uh, I just don't think that was a good design for a 44 Magnum. No offense to guys that love those firearms, but uh, haven't had anything like that firing these Smiths. I'm sure if I got into uh, less than four inches, if I got into a, a snub type 44, different story then. But uh, found them both to be very, very enjoyable to shoot. And um, really the only issues I had was just going back and forth between the two of them, between the two triggers. Like I said, the 29 trigger was just so much more refined. And the Model 6 29 trigger isn't bad. Not bad at all, but it, it is noticeably different. So it's just a matter of, uh, of um, making mental notes and, and getting some muscle memory down, remembering which, which firearm you're using. So 44, 357, 45 ACP, 9 millimeter, 22, 38, whatever you're shooting. My uh, strongest case I'd make for anybody is, is if you want your round to be an effective round from your firearm, the most important thing you can do is know your firearm, know how to maintain your firearm, and practice. And I mean practice. I go to the range every single week. Um, very, very seldom do I miss. And sometimes I go a lot more than that, especially if the weather's nice. Um, if you are practicing with your firearm, you're going to acquire muscle memory. You are going to be proficient shooting it. And most importantly, if you ever need that firearm to put food on your table, you're going to be ready. If you ever need that firearm to save your backside, you will be ready. That's just not going to happen by sitting around looking at them and polishing them and taking pictures, guys. It's just not going to happen. So my advice is get out and practice all you can. Um, if your thing is shooting 44 or stronger, go for it. I've, I've uh, acquired quite the taste with it with these Smith & Wessons. Um, if if your, your taste is shooting 38 and lighter, go for it. But um, these things just really don't shoot themselves, and you don't get better uh, by talking about it. You get better by doing, and I know at least that's the case for me. So I appreciate you watching today. As always, uh, um, thanks for tuning in. This is Dr. Drake 63 saying so long.